MFA from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. Andrew is currently a faculty member of Harrington College of Art and Design in Chicago. And I'll just, um, uh, these are two more of his drawings. Oh, there we go. Our second um, artist is Lisa Lebowski, who is a nomadic plein air painter collaborating with nature and people. Her work has been exhibited at such venues such as Savannah College of Art and Design, New Bedford Whaling Museum, Shelburne Museum, Lehman College, and El Museo de la Ciudad de Mexico. Lisa has held residencies across the US and also in Newfoundland. And importantly for tonight's event, as Michael has mentioned, she's the director of DN DFN projects in Manhattan. And uh, please do go see the show if you can before it closes tomorrow at four. And uh, Sherry McGraw is an artist and teacher whose early education took her to the Art Students League of New York, where she later served as a drawing and painting instructor. Her work has earned many awards and has been exhibited at major museums nationwide, including a retrospective at the Butler Institute of American Art in 2014. That museum's trustees recently awarded Sherry their Medal of Honor for Lifetime Achievement in American Art. So congratulations. Thank you, Laurel. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, two more of our participants. Uh, Melanie Vogt, a native of Iowa, received her BFA from Iowa State University and MFA from the New York Academy of Art. Her work has appeared at such venues as Sloan Fine Art, DFN Gallery, Equity Gallery, Flowers Gallery, and the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum. It has also been featured in Hyper Narrative in Seoul, South Korea, at the Hangarum Art Museum, and also at ADAH Abu Dhabi, where Melanie held a residency. I, I think we might have jumped one ahead, Laurel. Yes, Let's see if we can... I, I'm trying to, uh, oh, okay. trying to get yeah. back. But okay. I... <laughs> Ah, uh, the perils of Zoom. Yes, um, yes. It, it's absolutely fine. We can circle back to that. Why, why don't we stay here with, oh, oh yeah, that's fine. Okay. We, I wanted to introduce uh, Patricia Watwood, uh, a figurative painter whose work explores transformative narratives and mythological archetypes. She earned an MFA from New York Academy of Art and studied with Jacob Collins as a founding member of the Water Street Atelier. Patricia's works are in such collections as the New Britain Museum of American Art, and Harvard University, and she has exhibited worldwide. In 2012-13, she participated in an exhibition surveying American realism that toured six cities in China. So welcome everybody, thank you for being here. We're delighted to have you. Um, uh, we're, we're done with the slides uh, in the sense that they are here for our delectation. Uh, we can go back and have the artist talk about specific works uh, that are uh, in the show, but it's not necessary. Um, that was really wonderful to have Michael, show us the installation in video and still photography. So thank you and congratulations to absolutely everybody involved. Laurel, it's great to see you again. It is great uh, to see you too, Peter. <laughs> I'm sorry it has to be by Zoom, but you know, here we are. Uh, we were last together at the Sergeant Drawing Show uh, Indeed, with Michael. <laughs> with, with, and maybe some other people in this group, I think. Probably, um, that's right. <laughs> So um, we, Laurel and I were chatting a little bit before um, this uh, began about how we might want to roll this out. And we're really grateful uh, in advance for the insights of our panelists. Um, basically, I thought that I might just um, set it up a bit, if I may, uh, by stealing shamelessly uh, from others who have talked more eloquently than I ever could about the color blue. Um, it goes without saying that many books have been written on the shifting meanings of the color blue over time. Uh, one recent example um, was authored by the French medievalist Michel Pasteureau, uh, and that is absolutely in print. You can find the latest edition uh, at your local bookshop. Um, the summary uh, that I might want to convey in a minute uh, from this author uh, would start us off with uh, the ancient Greeks who thought that blue was ugly and barbaric, and therefore, in fact, we don't see much blue in ancient Western art or even referred to much in language. Uh, it was associated with the barbarians, in fact. Um, then everything changed in medieval Europe. Um, and really, we all think surely of the Virgin Mary uh, and the decoration of churches and works of religious art uh, when we think about the robe that the Virgin Mary was wearing. Now, please understand, I am referring to European or, if you will, Western culture. Um, 
and I don't pretend to know much about non-Western cultures and their relationship to blue. Uh, but I have a feeling that much of our conversation today will address uh, the Western tradition of art making. Uh, that is not in any way to denigrate uh, these other uh, traditions and legacies. Um, early modern Europe, of course, uh, took on blue in a new way uh, when it comes to royalty. Uh, that was something that was very um, uh, revered. Um, and then along comes the French Revolution, uh, which decided to utilize blue in its own way. Uh, we think about the tricolor uh, flag, of course, containing blue as well as red and white. Um, and then we jump to the 20th century and all sorts of other meanings uh, that could range from the blues music, um, blue jeans uh, as a symbol of resistance um, in the 1960s, um, earth seen from space is perceived as generally blue. Um, all of these ideas and many, many more are looming in the background every time an artist reaches for a blue pigment on her or his palette. And I wonder then if we could throw the question to our panelists to talk with us about what blue means to you. It's a very broad question, but we'll start uh, maybe in alphabetical order, if you don't mind. Andy, are you there? Could you give yes. us your feedback? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you well. All right, well, I'm from Chicago, and of course, Chicago is the home of the blues. So I'm representing my hometown, I guess you could say, when I'm using blue. Um, <laughs> but I also wanted to kind of point to, uh, you know, Patricia made that uh, link between color and drawing. And, um, you know, when you look at a lot of uh, classical drawings, uh, French academic drawings, for example, Italian drawings, often, uh, in many cases with the Italians, they do color the paper, they often tone the paper, uh, traditionally, or mm -hmm. silver point, metal point, and so on. Um, and so that those cool colors set off really nicely, um, uh, you know, the kind of rendering of the skin, uh, the rendering of the, the body. Um, also, I was going to mention that um, looking at a lot of the uh, classical drawings, you often see them with French mats. Um, and those mats are usually very beautifully colored, often with this really amazing deep blue. And uh, when I was, you know, when I was training uh, in art school, you know, I draw white paper with charcoal for, you know, years. Uh, but at some point I said, you know, I don't really want to draw with black and white media anymore. I want to use color. So um, thinking about those French mats and the beautiful colors, that made me think about, you know, just using color paper. And um, so those two kind of things, you know, looking at these Italian metal point drawings and then looking at these beautiful French mats uh, made me kind of st steered me toward using color uh, as a, as part of the, the practice. Um, I was going to mention one other thing about my medium, and that is a lot of times I draw with uh, Caran d'Ache color pencils, which are excellent uh, color pencils made in Switzerland. And what's great about their their um, products is that um, all their color pencils have a number system, and they make different thicknesses of pencil, well, the, I should say they make a pencil, they also make a kind of crayon, we call the Neocolor, and they also make an even larger, really big, almost like a cigar kind of thing. They're all, they're all using that same number system. So if you're gonna draw, you can, you can choose the, the color by the number system, and you can draw from a very fat line to a medium line to a fine line, all with the same color. So, um, so I, I really like their, their products. Uh, they work really, and the quality is excellent, of course. Great, so that's quite an asset. Thank you. Um, let's turn to Lisa. What are your thoughts on blue? Uh, as, as the, I think I'm the only exclusively landscape painter here. So my, my thoughts with blue are very much about space, uh, the, the murky depths of the ocean, the elusive horizon lines, and, and in that the desire and, and our relationship with the idea of the abyss, where it's our, our potential demise, but it's also, um, all of our, our hope and optimism, like the bright blue skies, but then again, with that murky death or that, that siren song of the horizon line that you can never attain, because it's always out there. And as soon as you get there, atmospheric blue isn't there anymore. It's unattainable, but it calls us out there. You know, we go to a mountaintop and we just see the blue all around us, but it's not, it's not really blue. I like that, unattainable. <laughs> <laughs> so powerful in life to recognize that some things are unattainable. <laughs> well, this is great work. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I, I don't think Sherry McGraw is with us yet. If she is, I hope she'll speak up. Nope. Okay, we'll jump to Melanie. Melanie, what are your <laughs> thoughts on blue? 
Well, I'm certainly with Lisa about the as as aspheric uh, quality of skies. And yeah. uh, I guess, honestly, when uh, Patty first came to me about blue drawings, I never really thought about the color blue that much, um, of, of using it as a ground. So it kind of opened me up to doing that. And I was, I welcomed the idea. Uh, but certainly a lot of my work um, has uh, the uh, the big blue sky as a, as a backdrop and the atmosphere is certainly uh, important. Also, the melancholic feeling that uh, comes with it, um, I guess, especially in this drawing. And yes. uh, the kind of, uh, that the previous drawing was uh, referencing kind of our, our fragility and uh, uh, mortality and the blue really felt right for it. Um, and then the second one with the overalls, uh, the same, um, I guess it was the color of the garment as well. So I was happy to, um, I actually started this one from life outside with a, a blue watercolor pencil and oh. uh, then came back uh, <clears throat> and set it, the still life up again and drew it from life. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Patty. Uh, you've already given us some thoughts on blue, but maybe you have a little more to say. Yeah, it's it, personal. It, part of it is just personal favorite. Like it is my favorite color. And I've always liked making hand toned papers um, with watercolor. And so as I just, you know, out of the sheer joy of the number of blue colors, there's like ultramarine and this color called Indian throne and there's Prussian blue and there's cerulean and there's cobalt and frankly i'm just i love all of those colors that's like my favorite range of part of the the chromatic spectrum but and they for me blue is like it's ethereal it's it's kind of spiritual it's an air sign i'm a libra i love my air signs um it's atmospheric like lisa was talking about sort of the in the the unattainable the horizon line but it also it's like when you look up at the sky it's also about infinite infinite distance right in infinity right yes. and sort of like you know literally something that goes on forever and so that that kind of those are feelings that i connect with the color blue um, but then i just started enjoying using them in my artwork because they because of the sky because of the atmosphere horizon line water all of these things that are so prevalent in our natural world if you use blue in your materials they actually start to really easily evoke in your imagination something kind of spatial and pictorial and i think actually i was starting doing all this because i was thinking about you know i paint but in a drawing, I would often just do a figure, but how do you maybe create pictorial space, like even like deep pictorial space in paper or on paper just with a drawing? And so I was kind of exploring blue um, and texture and atmosphere as a way to kind of create a, a sense of, of deep space or infinite space, even on a, on a ephemeral, um, thin, temporal piece of paper. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, all of you have conjured some fascinating ideas for us to go back and revisit. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Laurel, over yeah. to you. So, I mean, this sort of picks up on, on some of the things you're already discussing, but um, I, I think it's, I was so struck in looking at the drawings across the show and just um, how blue can set a kind of mood. And of course, blue can has a an association with mood as as a name but um I'm, I'm just wondering what kind of if there's a mood for you that um that blue conjures or a certain emotional power um i there's for me i i i felt a kind of wistfulness also but i think i i don't know if that's because we're a year into the pandemic this kind of wistful feeling that i feel when i look at at all of this blue but um I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the mood set by Blue, and we can uh, uh, go back in order again. So Andy, why don't uh, we begin with you? Um, well, definitely, it's, it's certainly a, a, a lower mood. It's a, it's, it certainly has that connotation of nighttime, um, resting. Uh, it's, it's, you know, emotionally, it's not hot, right? It's literally a cool color on the color wheel. Um, no, and so like, the idea is that you want to, <laughs> sorry, got a little bit of crosstalk there. Um, 
that it's, uh, it's something that's meant to be, I think, invites contemplation. It reduces, you know, your heart rate is supposed to go down so you can get a less heart and more head kind of thing, I guess. Um, mm. And also, uh, well, where I live, I, I can see Lake Michigan. So I look out every day and see the different shades of blue over the lake. And so it just reminds me of all those, you know, as Patty was mentioning, those infinite tones uh, in blue, you know, warm blues, cool blues, purplish blues, and so on. There's just a great range. Once you start staring at it, you see all this range and all this subtlety. So, um, so I think, yeah, when, I, when I'm doing these drawings, they're very con uh, contemplative. I'm, you know, the act of, of realistic drawing is a very contemplative act in the sense that you're in dialogue with this thing that you're drawing directly. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of time where you're investigating what you're doing, you're assessing what you're doing. Um, you're trying to decide what's correct, what's not correct. Um, there's limitations within the medium. So you can't just, it's not like charcoal, you just wipe it away. You, you really have to think before you draw. So there's a lot of thinking, a lot of contemplation, a lot of um, kind of working through the, the process very carefully. So that cool color really, I think, helps to calm you down and help you uh, work consistently, quietly. Well, I feel calmer already. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so how about Lisa? Uh, so, so blue, um, I, I was just thinking about it, I, you know, I hadn't really thought of it in these terms because I, I am fascinated by the dichotomy of feelings that can happen from it. But at first glance, blue is very hopeful and, um, it, you know, there, there is optimism, optimism in it. Uh, and, and it's, it's alluring. It's, it's, you know, like it's water and it's the sky and these, you know, air, it's the, it's the elements that we need to survive. But as you layer it and it develops its density as it moves to night, or what I do in my work is just this layering and layering and layering of blues and you end up with this dense black <laughs> that, you know, just it, it can devour you. And so, and I, I hadn't thought about that until just now, or just see, you know, hope is this kind of, uh, it, it's this feeling that also, I, like I love in Spanish, like uh, it, hope in, in Spanish also can mean weight. And it's, it's, you know, it's a synonymous word and, uh, or a, you know, an interchangeable word. And, uh, it, you know, and there is that way and, and that just, the, the, there is a tension inherent with it. And, and so, yeah, there's just, it, it's very, it's a very uh, uh, a compelling color. It's got so much depth and, and not just literally, but just also <laughs> psychologically. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and Melanie? Yes, I'm not feeling that uh, wordy tonight, I have to say. I love blue. It's always been one of my favorite favorite colors. I think it par partially because I feel like I, I'm from uh, a remote area in Iowa where it, that was the primary color that we'd see all year long. And one thing I was thinking about after we spoke a, a while ago, the uh, psycho psychological aspects of color and why we choose certain colors. But something I feel like that's very calming is that I can relate to the sky and it always feels like home. Like you, I can go to the park and just lie on the grass and look up and kind of forget where I'm at. So it, it's been wonderful kind of absorbing this color blue. And um, it's also what Lisa said about the, the darks, how it can really um, create a sense uh, or just depending, there's such a huge range of blues um, and they, it has such an um, immense um, range of psychological aspects, whether it's a cerulean blue or uh, trying to think of the the name that I would give it, but it's something of a Caribbean blue versus a, a Payne's gray, which is my favorite dark. Um, and you can add a red to it and make a, a various, a, a varied uh, temperature of black or, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank, oh, that's, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I love, I mean, it's, I love hearing all of these the sky imagery and uh, all of you talking about um, it, it's sort of especially I don't know I think I've spent a lot of time looking at the sky the past year um, mm -hmm. yes so Patty do you want to add well I just I wanted to comment on something you said Laurel about how the the work and the show made you feel a little wistful right and I think for me, blue, like it does evoke like a sense of openness, like looking at the sky, like Melanie was saying, which is so what we haven't been able to do, especially, you know, during the pandemic, during the winter, 
So blue for me really evokes like openness, breath, air, freedom, which I think is one of the reasons why I find the show so appealing right now is because it kind of evokes all of these things that I've been sort of cloistered away from and kind of am drawn to. Um, like Andy said, I think that blue is, it is a very, well, I would almost like it's, I think of it as like an enlightenment color. I think of like, you know, French 18th century, like salons and, and it's like an, it's, it's, um, it has balance and poise. It's not, it's not hot and temperamental. It's like, it's reasoned and calm and open. And I think right now, like I'm all of that stability and intellectualism and openness sounds really appealing to me. <laughs> Well, I'm as someone who studies the 18th century, I also uh, appreciate that um, that enlightenment feeling, and I and that um, I one of the other things I was I was wondering about was um, I think there some of you have talked about the contemporaneity of blue and also the historical trajectory of blue, and when I think of blue and drawing, I, I think of sort of Italian papers and, um, mm -hmm. and Venice and the, that tradition that extends forward. And I wondered um, to what extent you feel your, what um, sort of, if you are drawing on historical precedents and, and Andy, you've already spoken to this some, but you may want to say more, um, just sort of uh, thinking about your art in relation to this longer trajectory of blue, um, if, that's, if, uh, if that's something that you feel fits. Well, I mean, um, the couple of images just popped into my mind. And one is the, you know, the Matisse blue cutout nudes, you know, um, the other is Eve Klein's uh, experiment mm -hmm. with the color blue and the figure. You're probably familiar with those, I'm sure, right? Where you take the model and he would uh, paint the model's body with blue paint, have them roll around on a canvas. And then later he takes the, the Venus, you know, the Venus statue and co coats it with that special blue that he patented or whatever he did to that ultramarine blue. And um, so those are kind of more contemporary, I guess, models, uh, more daring you know, approaches to blue and the figure. Um, and of course, there's the Blue Man group, I guess you could say as well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I still don't understand exactly why these people are blue, but uh, <laughs> um, but it, in terms of, yeah, I mean, definitely, I'm, I'm uh, clearly, I'm looking at historical precedents for the figure drawings. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in Ang's drawings, although mm -hmm. he didn't really use blue all that much. Um, He's using graphite, which is a kind of a new, the graphite pencil was kind of a new invention when he was around. Um, but certainly looking at older precedents, uh, people using, uh, you know, colored media and colored papers and so on. Uh, so yeah, I'll just leave it there. Uh, how about you, Lisa? Um, I mean, I, not specific to the blue, um, although I, I, Rockwell Kent's work is really, uh, I'm very, uh, it, it leaves a big impression on my work for sure. Um, but I, I think it's more about the, the texture, uh, but his palette as well, which, which you know, definitely is, especially his paintings of, of the Northern landscapes are very uh, dealing with, you know, blue. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, I, and I, but it's specific to color though, and it, it doesn't have to be blue. It's, it's, you know, like Sanford Gifford, who's, you know, has some river era painter, his, his work is very inspirational to me because of, of these constant colors, uh, temperature shifts, mm. and, and how he, uh, and it's just, it's constant from whatever the light source is, it's just this constant radiating. And, and just thinking of paintings in layers that way and how you have, in this one, and for me, the light, let's say, is the actually the dark of the horizon in this one, and just how it radiates out from that focal point um, and it's, it, but it doesn't translate in temperature shifts in this, but it's that same idea of, of how to uh, construct a painting. And, um, uh, and, and this one is dependent on blue, because it was actually a blue, a blue paper that I worked on that I heavily textured. And when I started with these depths and then, and then radiated out with varying textures and bands of lights and then introducing some warmer, green, uh, warmer blues in there to counteract the, the coolness of the, the darker blue. Um, and then, and then just also subject matter wise, you know, look, especially looking at, at painters from, you know, the, the 1800s and when they were starting their expeditions up north, you know, when Church went up there and his paintings of ice and Bradford and, um, 
and seeing how, how they uh, were engaging with the landscape there, but then also thinking about it in terms of, of climate change today and observing mm -hmm. how the landscapes have, have changed mm -hmm. and, and what it means to be painting ice today, which is now this fleeting object. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, if I may jump in, I, I, I've been sort of um, uh, tingling uh, to ask Lisa about the environment, about younger people's understandable anxiety about the future of our world and whether there is something to be addressed here. I, I, this exhibition is thrilling and I wonder if there is momentum among working artists to think about not literally just blue, but the notion of the environment as something that we should be, um, you know, putting forward. We're, we're all a little bit worried about the consumption of works of art, the purchasing of works of art by younger people who tend to be a bit anti-stuff. Uh, and yet, you know, there's a way perhaps to connect with their very strong interest in the environment. I'm just throwing that out at you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to address that quickly? <laughs> yeah, anything you can. <laughs> uh, yes, there, there is a lot of artists who, who definitely uh, address this. And actually, Melanie Vogt, who's here, she's, we're studio mates, and her and I have had many conversations about the, uh, the, the uh, her work also addresses a lot, but uh, will also yep. address environmental themes. And, sure. uh, but just the idea of generating, like we're artists who are you know, making work about our, the world, and, and like there's these bigger issues, and we're just generating more stuff. <laughs> And how do we navigate that? But but I actually went to this this talk uh, with a, a researcher, a scientist of, uh, who's doing work in the Arctic, and you know, like they have, they do a lot of flights because they're they're for their research, they're like checking the depths of the ice and like monitoring and, and you know, it's like, but you're flying, and and she said something which I was, and which I think rings true towards that, but also especially for art, which is sometimes the message is greater. And you have to have the conversation and you, you have to have these messages and you know put these messages out there and this knowledge and this education and um so uh so that i always remember that <laughs> whenever i go through my useful own. yeah yes. <laughs> but i mean a lot of my work is on recycled material like this is a lot of this is found paper and and it, it, you know like the aluminum pieces i do are primarily recycled material and um a significant percentage so th there is a consideration of that but a lot of artists are working on, yeah. on this stuff so that's that's yeah I'm, well, I'm not i'm not working in a vacuum because there's there's a lot of us out there so i i, I appreciate that I, and i just wanted to raise that as a theme that we all can you know maybe think on uh as we go forward not that every artist needs to be in that zone but it's really cool to know that there's a lot yeah. of energy there thank you laurel i'm yeah, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt that's <laughs> <laughs> all right i was gonna jump in and uh to what peter was saying and and lisa I think that, and it was mentioned earlier, that image I think that comes from the 60s or what, of the earth, right, from space as a blue pearl, right? And I think that that is a, an, an image that all of us as contemporary painters very much have in mind, that our fragile earth is one single blue pearl in a vast infinite space. And it, you know, and so definitely I, I connect the idea of blue with that. And I definitely see that in, you know, in Lisa's work and, and fragility. And um, so I think that you, know, you asked about historical, you know, images, but I feel like everything we think about historical images is like, of course, black and white photos gallery tone paintings like everything seems sort of brown and black and sepia but i think that now like the colored world around us the blue planet the blue like this is what it fe to me feels like to be very contemporary and to be very conscious of this this thin blue fragile pearl that we live on well you want to have uh, open for a second sure I, I wanted to just uh, talk a bit about this idea about color space and because we were talking about the, the how blue is contemporary. And I remember uh, one of the first groups of painters I fell in love with were color field painters. And uh, explicitly uh, Barnett Newman. And, uh, and he was creating these big, immense color paintings, right? And, um, and one was blue. And it was just all blue. And it was one of the paintings I was thinking about when Penny and I first thought about doing the show. And he was coming with that group of painters out of World War II Europe. And this goes back to this wistful idea of blue that you were, Laurel, you were talking about earlier. And what Bonnet said was he didn't know what to paint. 
And nobody knew what to paint after the war because they were worried that they would lyricize. It's going back to what Lisa's talking about, like what's the message, right? What, what can I talk about here? And not sort of make it lyrical, meaning uh, uh, trivialize it, right? We didn't want to make it a song or a poem that people could compartmentalize it. And they'd seen enormous suffering and beyond enormous suffering. You know, similar to the situation that I felt coming out of COVID, you know, sort of like how much loss we felt and how could we talk about that? Because you can't without lyricizing it, right? Sort of trivializing it. And he said he came, Barnett, so he came to this open field and all he saw was blue and he couldn't see the ends of the blue. And he thought, how could I make a painting of that? So he just did this enormous field. And if you stand in front of a colorful painting, you get the sensation that you can't see. All you have is this enveloping, wistful space. And so comforting. And when you go into the show that Lisa and Patty so lovingly hum, you get that same sense of space, of this sort of, and you know, there's, of course, there's figures in it. And we've added, you know, our concerns, which are, you know, the figure and the landscape, which is part of the realist project. But the, uh, the, the feeling of the blueness of the, uh, of the, of the space, of the room to breathe in a time that's um, constricted. I think Patty talked about that quite well as well. Um, really why I think the show is so important. And I can't wait to see how it reiterates again down in Birmingham with the, with the sort of addition of large scale paintings. I know we're putting in a couple of Kinslers, which I think haven't been seen in, in a very long time. Um, that I think will really add a lot of energy to this idea about, you know, how color creates space and contemporary. And I think it will also help sort of jump the Realist Project. I think it also sort of expands out the Realist Project to sort of this contemporary push against what else is out there. My impression, two cents. Absolutely That's exciting. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, and I, um, I wanted to give Melanie a chance to uh, respond if she wanted to. Okay, so I'm going to circle back to the question. It was relating to historical influences. Is that where we left? Yes. If, um, <laughs> okay. uh, it, we've kind of gone in different directions and they're all rich topics. I guess uh, just off the top of my head, I think of uh, the Degas drapery studies that just every time I look at them, I just melt. Um, he, I, I love Degas. I see him a piece of his from across the room, not knowing that it's him. And I already know it's him. You know, he's one of my, my favorites. Um, just really speaks to me. Um, and then I, after hearing all this conversation, was thinking about my early loves and influences and um, the Klimt and also the, the artists that are either called new objectivity or new realists, like Otto Dix um, mm. and all of these in-between war painters and their very expressive use of color. Um, when I was an undergrad, the most the, uh, important thing my first painting teacher told me is go wash your hands because I was covered in phthalo blue. I just couldn't stop, you know, all of my paintings were um, kind of monochromatic and green phthalo blue. And I've kind of gotten away from that. In fact, I try to use lighter palettes because... Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I love uh, the openness, but there's, there's a lot of ways to get through that or get to that. And I, I guess Elizabeth and Crimson is my new crush um, and all the variations of that kind of direction. But today, I, I, a contemporary artist I just absolutely love, um, Victor Mann. Um, he's a, a, I don't know exactly, I can't remember where he's from, but I believe that's his name. Anyway, monochromatic blues and green paintings, and also Lisa Uscovich, how she's mm -hmm. kind of delved into all these monochromatic worlds. Um, so these are people I think of when I think of blues. And in, in, in fact, there's been a, such a, a wave of kind of night paintings, um, really saturated mm -hmm. palettes recently that uh, you know, I get very excited about. It. I kind of wish I could reinvent myself at this period in my life, and I keep trying, but then I keep finding myself as a realist. Um, I'm sure we all can relate. Um, and then just a tiny bit um, uh, in in reference to Peter's question um, about uh, the environment and and artist place uh, that I found a bit comforting um, is Naomi, Naomi. Excuse me, Naomi Klein's book on fire. It's a, she's a, a writer that is, she's Canadian and um, 
anyway, I, I uh, listened to a lot of books and that was one of them and it was get, got, got wrenching, but, and um, hopeful at the same time. But one of the things she said is we need more artists and educators and jobs that create a little bit less, you know, toxic uh, kind of, or we leave a, a less toxic uh, trail uh, in comparison to so many other industries. So even though we make stuff, um, you know, how, how, how bad is cotton duck um, compared <laughs> to, you know, I don't know. Anyway, all right. Thank you so Agreed. much, Laurel. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. You're absolutely you. right. How bad is Cotton Duck? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I actually am thrilled to hear that the Birmingham presentation will involve paintings. Um, I'm tempted to fly there and see it uh, during its run, uh, but I don't want to uh, move along without addressing drawing itself. I mean, this show is so important because it is all drawing. Um, and I'd love to hear from the artists about um, the, the, what drawing means to them as a standalone practice that obviously can interrelate uh, with preparatory work or in this case, you know, these things are absolutely being uh, seen and loved as independent uh, uh, works of art. Um, give me some feedback on that. And are we in a, a renaissance mode when it comes to interest in drawing among artists or among uh, collectors? Um, what about the expressiveness of drawing? Uh, we talked about uh, sort of going into the zone. Uh, I think Andy was kind of touching on that, the calming aspect. Um, obviously blue was the factor there, but maybe drawing itself has some cathartic effects. Andy, let me pick on you. Uh, any thoughts about drawing as a whole? Well, I mean, I really mostly draw now as, uh, as preparatory work, as studies for, um, for paintings, because my focus mainly is on figurative painting. Sure. So, um, but, but of course, I love to draw the figure whenever I get a chance that is just a sketch kind of session. We do that in Chicago. We've done that before the pandemic. My wife and I would set up uh, sketch sessions uh, with friends and a model, and it's the most enjoyable thing you can do. You just don't have to, you can, you know, it's just therapeutic in the sense that you can block out everything. You're so focused on the drawing that it just takes every other problem away from you. So it's very, it's, I think, mentally extremely very good uh, as an exercise to do, yeah. But mainly for my own work, I do it as preparatory for the paintings. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Lisa. So, <laughs> um, I, I kind of come to my own place of where I, I settled on what drawing is, because this can also be painting, because it is with a sure. brush, it's with paint. But yes. I, I've curated a few drawing shows, and this has always been a question of like, well, where do we draw the line? Without, without making a pun there, but you know, where do we draw the line of like, what's a drawing, what's a painting? Yep. And uh, for me, uh, and I've had many disputes and, and but where I've settled <laughs> is that drawing, it, 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 in, it, engage, it discusses tone, value. Um, it, it's, not, it's not an exploration in color, it's just an expor exploration in mark making, uh, so texture. Uh, so really, like to me, if it's if it's about mark and and um, value, there's your drawing. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And and much of my work, I mean, I, the only way I'll even fully distinguish it is, you know, if it's uh, once once it's uh, you know mounted on something bigger. <laughs> if I take a work on paper and mount it on a board, then it might be like, all right, now we can call it a painting. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know, I, I you know it, it can be uh, it can it can change its mind. <laughs> right, <laughs> very flexible. Yeah. Um, well, I, I like that idea though of um, this um, reevaluation, redefining of what drawing is. And I would like to give credit where credit is due to organizations like the Drawing Center and the Manila Institute for Drawing because they are opening all of us, including art lovers, not people in the art world at all, but just people who visit to what drawing is and can be. Um, but clearly, uh, we, we have a, a, a specific set of works here in this exhibition that are in you know, a zone of a kind. Um, let me jump to Melanie. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on the renaissance of drawing, or is that a, a silly term? Um, I'm not sure. I feel like drawing is just something that everyone does, uh, and then sometimes they just stop. I read a quote by Via Selman that she said, as kids, we just draw. And then so I think it was her that said that. But also, um, you know, 
drawing has has evolved and changed and and gone through different phases i suppose with art history so to call it a renaissance i'm not sure i think it's mm -hmm. always it's always kind of percolating or or there's some group that's that's maintaining its hold um and i guess i feel like i i'm super lucky that i got to study with a lot of uh wonderful drawing teachers um and uh anyway i and i also feel very lucky that i teach drawing and it keeps me like working with students uh doing figure drawing every week um either if it's on zoom right now or in person sometimes if we're lucky enough um you know it's just it, it it's it's something that it that response to the world around is so important also just to be able to have uh the ability to 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 use gesture as a way to kind of pull ideas out of wherever they come from and put them on the page. I guess that's where what drawing means most to me. And I don't draw enough. I have to say I've been making myself draw uh, more recently. And I, I got to see the Goya exhibition at the Met last Friday. Mm -hmm. And Good. I just was so inspired after. And there was a, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember if it was an etching or a a drawing of a tree with people in it that I'd never seen before and I got so excited. So anyway, um, but yeah, drawing as a renaissance, perhaps I'd like, I like the idea. <laughs> we'll work on it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I, I want to uh, give praise to John Bellardo who put a chat up about the 9-11 museum uh, in downtown Manhattan and the uh, painting there uh, and the evocation of the blue sky on that Tuesday morning. I think that's really interesting because, you know, Patty talked very eloquently about us being shaped by uh, the image of Earth in space, and that has shaped our time and everyone after. And I would argue that many of us are also impacted by 9-11 and its visuality. And I'm so glad you raised that. I don't know if John wants to talk about that. I'm not sure if you have, um, yourself on unmute. <laughs> I, I don't see oh, you. So, um, oh, oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add. You, you said everything. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's, I, a, I did that's a wonderful experience to go see that. Yeah. Did not want to put you on the spot, but thank you. I just wanted to uh, hear your thoughts. Um, I don't know if the um, panelists have any thoughts on that. Um, not specifically the work of art necessarily, but that notion of uh, the infinity of the sky that day carrying a very dangerous message or, or aspect uh, as opposed to one of calm or one of uh, the sublime. Well, it's the juxtaposition of those two things, right? It's this perfectly beautiful day and then yeah. everything is completely, you know, uh, destroyed. Um, yeah. The calm is completely destroyed, and the juxtaposition of the colors too. You know, the fire against that blue. You know, these are complementary colors. Um, the yes. orange, the yellow, is the red. So that just the stark difference, the juxtaposition, the stark, um, just hard to believe. You know, kind of aspect of it, almost like a movie, that kind of thing. So, but it was real. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I. I. That's that's a beautiful. Point that was that was brought up that the idea of that monument and a memorial and, and, and the use of the blue with that and it, you know it is one of those you know inevitably when especially in New York is I think any any American when they meet like there's inevitably the conversation of September 11th and where were you that day and uh, but then particular to hear uh, you know and everybody remembers where they were that day but then particular to hear the fact that it was this jarringly beautiful perfect 72 degree September day and um, and just how like discombobulating that was like nonsensical, and but so so in addition like we, we've already said the things about like you know like the the uh, dichotomy of feeling and the sublime and like the horrors of that like the sublime is either your demise or your potential like that's why we're so like oh, mesmerized by it but it, it so speaks to that but. Uh, it's also, it's the grand unifier, like everybody experienced and had the weird relationship with that blue sky. And it, it was, it's actually, uh, you know, a, a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, just something that brings us together in a very, very sad way. But, but we all, everybody had that feeling, which is, which is magical. It is. Thank you.
Yeah. Um, I, Michael and Laurel, I wonder if we might take the screen down so that we can see each other and ask people to raise their hands if they have specific questions. Um, maybe that would make it a little more community. There we go. That's great. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, if if you, oh, uh, Phoebe Bernard. Uh, yeah. This is Hi. Beverly. I'm wanted, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just reading the uh, sign there. Okay. That's yeah. all right. Um, I just wanted to invite everyone to Birmingham for the show. I'll never forget the one that we had in New York several years ago when it was curated by Michael and Patty. And it was, you could not squeeze another person into the gallery. And I'll never forget because Michael said, uh, well, I said, we should make a blue cocktail. He said, oh, I know how, let's make a blue whale. And I had never heard of a blue whale and we made them and they turned totally green. I'll never forget it. And we had to throw them all out. It was really a great night though. And the, paint, the drawings were just that, uh, fantastic. And we're really looking forward to um, having hosting the show in Birmingham. And I hope you will consider coming. Love to. Thank you. I'm looking for hands. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, wait, I thought I just saw, hold on. Oh, Andrew, I think. There we go, yes. So I was included with the show. Um, I'm an abstract painter um, that participates in a figurative drawing class once a week. Um, I am also a full-time bartender, so my recommendation for a batch cocktail might be a Blue Hawaiian for the next uh, opening, <laughs> which is super simple and delicious by all. A nice rum punch for everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm taking notes here. <laughs> a, blue, a Blue Hawaiian will go far. Um, uh, I, a little bit about my work. Um, I'm Thanks. an abstract painter um, in, in uh, studio practice for 18 years um, I paint subconscious abstract meaning I don't have a, a final intent um, of what the painting is going to look like when I start. I use music as my influence both in the studio and in my figure drawing practice. This one here displayed by Lisa is called Devil's Haircut um, which is a Beck song um, so you can kind of Put that tune into your head while you look at the piece and you'll see uh, a little bit of chaos but balance flow and uh, the idea that it's uh, playful. Um, I bring my abstract technique to the figure drawing. Um, what happens with my abstract is I find no mistake um, in my painting uh, so it's application process um, you can look at it as um, application to other applications. So it's kind of, you're reacting to the marks that are already on the canvas. Um, these pieces are used blue painter's tape. In this practice, I tape, I pull all the tape first and then apply the tape in an abstract form without re-tearing the tape. Um, with that idea, it's subconsciously torn using the shapes that are already um, torn. Um, music is my main uh, rhythm in my painting and I'm going to go to Miles Davis kind of blue. Um, best uh, jazz album I've ever listened to in my, in my life um, and I get a lot of, um, a lot of uh, feeling from Miles Davis. Um, I also particularly uh, admire Picasso's Blue Period, mm -hmm. um, sure. not to be overlooked. And uh, I call myself uh, the Blue King. I have blue eyes and blue is my favorite color. So when it comes to blue, it was an honor to be a part of this show. Well, thank, I'm thank telling you, you thank you. And you, you were born for this exhibition. I mean, there it is. That's just perfect. I, I can't I, believe my ears. I, I thank Michael for uh, uh, including me with the show and I look forward to showing my pieces in Alabama. Thank you. Great, very much. congratulations. Now I saw that Alexi Steele had raised a hand. Um, are you, I don't see you. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, well, somewhere there. Okay. I wanted to congratulate 
everybody on a great show. Michael, Patty, uh, Peter, what a fantastic, great exhibition. One of the most marvelously curated from the first one uh, that was such a great pleasure to see in person to the second one that carries a special meaning. But the re reason I raised the hand is actually, there was an interesting thought um, that veering from our, with our great uh, realist project, obviously, that is now in the important stage, kind of uh, really already having its own foundation, but with natural alliances and natural directions of that project to the broader, greater or, or art world is huge and great. Have you thought um, of this really amazing movement in the 50s that was pretty much New York concurrent to uh, what we see in all museums, but is not unfortunately seen in many museums of sort of aesthetic uh, wing of abstract art. And there was a really great group of uh, aesthetic abstract artists mm. uh, that, whose art um, built on a really, a lot of concepts, visual ideas, visual philosophy that, uh, that the realist uh, type of art form is built, but they're doing it in abstract forms and you know, I had a great first-hand experience with that with Chris's dad who you know Chris Pugliese uh, Chris's dad who was part of that movement so there is this really interesting great authentic New York uh, part of that culture that is not I think sufficiently studied or presented and I think in many ways uh, that could be a natural aesthetic uh, counterpoint ally in any ways in our beautiful, great, big, wide art world. And that was my question as you on the curatorial side, Michael or Peter, uh, if there's something that you would, uh, uh, that you would consider. Uh, Michael, please, uh, what are your thoughts? That's a really interesting point. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Am I, am I unmuted? Yep. Yeah, absolutely fine. I just wanna bounce a little bit back to this question about drawing and then I'm gonna segue into what Alexi's talking about was, we all have a very short memory. And I was the uh, Dean of New York Academy of Art when that plane hit uh, the World Trade Center. And when I went to school, you couldn't draw because nobody could teach you how to draw. And what we did, there was a group of us would get together at night in the basement of the gym and take our clothes off and draw each other before the faculty could find out. And there was more flesh than Baywatch, but it's sort of like how we could draw. So, you know, the, there's a 20 minute segment there in the screen, right, of art history, where suddenly it wasn't being taught, right? So, so, so you know, I just wanna bring that to the foreground to remember that this is still very new in the scheme of things. This idea about drawing as a practice, whether it's standalone or informing your paintings. And then I just wanna branch a little bit over to what Andrew uh, Hockenberry was talking about. And then it becomes research. Right, and so drawing is this idea that you're just, ex it's my first exploration, my first move into the figure, or my first move into the landscape, or my first flight of a feeling is my drawing, right? So, and then, um, so to Alexi, you know, the Whitney ran out of money, right? It was uh, right after the, what was that? When, when did things tank, 2012, 2011? What? with the real estate bust, whatever that period was. None of the big museums had any money, right? So they couldn't do their blockbusters anymore. So they started dragging shit up from the basement. Sorry, not, wrong word, stuff <laughs> from the basement. That was totally outside the canon, right? That worked that we none of us did. And I, you know, we were calling all our friends saying, did you see the last show at the Whitney? I mean, and to Lexi's point, it was all figurative. It's like, where is this stuff been at, right? So there was this, this whole counter movement that Alexi's talking about that was happening outside. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I think all work is great, and I think it does happen concurrently, but it, the prevailing art historical model is, you know, figurative, then abstract, and then I don't know then what happens. So, but really, there are two trains, right? And they're coursing along. So that, for me, is a very fertile area of curatorial exploration. It's like, yeah. what was happening in the 50s were, you know, there were also these outsider artists, too, that were sort of, you know, BIPOC, artists that were like working in these figured practices that something was like, you know, being pulled out because the times had opened up and we could talk about that. 
we could talk about women artists, we could talk about black artists, we can talk about figure artists. So now we have this lovely open playing field where we can start to sort of explore all that. And then finally to Alessia, to your point, that connection is very important. Like establishing that lineage is essential for current artists so we can build their market. You know, and that, you know, I mean that both market aesthetically and price, right? That, that we establish a foundation that shows this is just not something that just happened. This has been going on and on and on and on. Um, I hope that answers, somewhat answers the question, but it, I'm just asking questions, right? That's why we well, move cultures forward, right? We ask questions. Ab absolutely. I mean, that the, there is that idea of putting it on the table and everyone can ruminate. Um, I love that suggestion. And I agree that now we are back to a moment in American cultural history where museums are going to have to turn to their collections more as they did after the economic crisis that Michael was describing. So maybe this is a chance to revisit some of that material. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed the canon is broader as it should be, uh, but also let's talk about those uh, different approaches to art um, that, that have uh, uh, flourished uh, either famously or, or quietly uh, in American life. That's great. Any other questions? We don't want to keep you here all night, uh, but, oh, Ellen? Uh, nope, um, let's see. I saw a wave there, but that yeah, might not have That's been. me, it's Ellen. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. First of all, fabulous show, beautiful show. I keep going back and scrolling through. I can't see it in person, unfortunately, but it's, it's just a really wonderful show. The word that I didn't hear in the whole discussion of blue, and thank you so much for raising a color as a topic in art. That, that's just a very wonderful approach to take. I didn't hear innocence. And to me, blue, we're living in a very increasingly hot planet. When you think of anger, when you think of, of temper, um, any of the, the hot emotions, they're not always good emotions. Mm. And what I see in the blue and in many of the, in the pieces that are in the show is a a priori peacefulness. Mm -hmm. And it had, it, in the selection of the blue paper itself, you've moved into a cool realm. You've moved into a, a much cooler statement. So I'd, I'd like to hear what some of the artists have to say about that. Blue to me is a beautiful color in the, in the, um, Arabic world, turquoise is, is the color of luck and happiness. And so, and even behind you nodding away happily there, there's this beautiful blue in the background. The, the, so these are tiles from Damascus, Ellen. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, here we go. Yeah, I was wondering where that, where that beauty was from. Right. So I, I would like to hear more about how, if I were to approach a, a, an alizarin crimson or bright red canvas, it would, be such a different mood than approaching a blue canvas, a, a, a canvas that's been prime blue. Absolutely. So, uh, artists, please. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, Melanie or Lisa, uh, and Andrew, uh, what, any thoughts on that? Uh, I was just going to mention that I think um, you mentioned the word innocence. And as far as I know, I think I, I could be wrong on this, but I believe that children, babies cannot actually see the color blue. That the color blue is something, the ability to see that color is acquired a little bit later in childhood. And that could explain partly why, um, you know, that, that color blue sometimes is missing from a lot of literature. You know, you mentioned the Greek literature here. Yeah. Um, it could have be something to do with the way people were just not recognizing something that was, seems obvious to us. Yeah, um, how interesting. But certainly, um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something inviting about that, that blue uh, surface. And of course, if you wanted to make something aggressive or very intense, you could start with a really warm ground. Um, and if you're looking at, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, Renaissance painting, a lot of Baroque painting starts with that really warm ground, and they're building cool colors on top of that to try to uh, replicate the coolness of the light that's coming in uh, in the studio situation. So you're balancing the cool light against the warm shadow, and that's a that's a truism among realist painters. Um, but uh, yeah, I would I would agree that the blue surface is very um, it's a very very calming, uh, very stable stabilizing surface emotionally. Thank you, Melanie. There's just such a range of blue. I can imagine when you say innocence, I can imagine a blue that. Uh, comes to mind when you say innocence, um, certainly. Um, but for some reason, the, the color blue, 
uh, elicits in me more of a uh, melancholy or, or a calm in it depends on the, the color if it's slightly gray um, or but more of a, towards the Prussian side a little bit uh, more moody but a, a bright blue sky the sense of innocence of, of a, a planet that hasn't yet uh, been destroyed <laughs> but yeah that's interesting I thank you for bringing up the idea of innocence um, and it certainly uh, makes sense thanks Lisa um, I, I, you know, I can't say that I'm using blue and, and or thinking about it in terms of innocence, at least not consciously. Um, and so, and I can't, so I can't speak to artists who are doing that. Um, cause in my work, I'm, I'm painting the stories of dead and dying landscapes. And so there's, that's the, the antithesis of it, but, but like in the specifics of the work that's here and that, that you've seen on the screen, it like that work would have started with, um, a lighter blue, more lofty blue, and then it just, you know, burying it in darker and darker colors, and then, you know, pulling out some lights again, and then pushing it back down under the water, <laughs> like off into the horizon. So, um, so for, for me, that's not my engagement with the color, at least not consciously, like that could be, I didn't think about it till now, like, oh, okay, yeah, no, with those sort of, I'm not making a beautiful, you know, innocent blue. <laughs> covering it. <laughs> Got it. Well, thank you. Uh, Michael, um, how are we doing on time? Should we begin to wind this down? Um, we know that folks want to eat some supper. I, I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. Um, I would like to just ask Melanie, though, if she would just, uh, Melanie's got a happening, happening really soon. So those that are in the know, um, Melanie's show opened March 10th of last year at Equity Gallery. It was an amazing show called uh, the wash house and it closed the next day uh, and so and that was after two years of work um, so talk about blue skies and catastrophe um, but Melanie is uh, has produced a catalog of that work uh, which we're really excited about it's the first catalog that equity has produced or co-produced and she's doing a, a, a sort of a rebirth of that show and Melanie maybe you just could talk about it you do it better than I would about what's about to happen at Equity in a couple of weeks. Great, thank you so much, Michael, for letting me uh, uh, mention it to everyone. So uh, actually the, the pop-up exhibition will open April 3rd, but we're inviting artists to bring work on March 31st and April 1st to the gallery. And they all need to be small works. If you want to know all the details, uh, please have, uh, uh, Michael or uh, Gina put you in touch with me. But basically the theme of the wash house um, was, uh, or, or the, the wash house, I titled the show, The Wash House, Nothing Ever Happened Here. It was a really bad idea. It jinxed the whole exhibition. It closed, it opened the 12th and then everything was shutting down the 13th. Uh, but anyway, uh, a wash house is a building that people would traditionally wash their clothes and, um, I was just obsessed with this building and trying to figure out kind of what happened there. And the years leading up to um, the exhibition were very uh, turbulent. And I guess I, I wanted to try to find something of substance that actually happened there, but there was nothing really. It was just kind of about a lot of lives that perhaps came and went through the place and were folded into the soil that surrounded the, the structure. Uh, the story is just kind of lost of... Of, of people. And so there were remnants and things of that in the, in the sky. But I'm inviting artists to uh, basically reflect on the year and uh, think about a social issue or something, a driving force in their art, um, and make a small drawing, something that's not too big. And uh, I think the dimensions are 12 by 36 inches. It could, it could be very long, but I'm actually going to uh, put a, a a makeshift closed line in the gallery and ask artists to hang the work on uh, on the, the, the closed line. So it should be very interesting as a, a pop-up installation, small drawings, works on uh, paper or, or fabric would be preferable. And it, I want it to be very inclusive. Um, so if you have an idea or uh, think of something the next few days uh, and you're an artist that, that wants to participate, please reach out to Equity Gallery about that. Thank you so much, Michael. 
great. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, that sounds that's great. Fabulous. Yeah. And thank you all. I think we're going to be wrapping things up. So while I have my mic on, I just wanted to thank you for this <laughs> wonderful conversation, everyone for being here. And, and I'm honored to, to be a part of all of this. Thank you. We appreciate your insights. It's been fun. Right. I, I just want to give, can we give a round of applause to all the artists that are here? Yes. Today? And also to our panelists who did, did a great job. And, um, and, the, and the sense of community that equity strives for, I think really came through tonight. And really shown. So uh, if we don't have any further questions, um, I think we can all kiss each other goodbye. <laughs> and uh, stay tuned. If you're not a member of Equity Gallery, you ought to become one because it's a fabulous community. And, uh, and here we are tonight celebrating that. So adieu, and I'll, I'll see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, you. So Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Bye. 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 Good night. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations. Good night, everybody. Great to see. Hope to see you for soon. Bye, Lexi. Good to see you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Thank you all for coming. Good to see you all. Good to see you, Andy. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Love to Helen. I will.